it's a good investment if you are concerned about inflation and you're watching you know, the money you have in your savings account kind of dwindle away. They're appropriate for your average millennial retail investor um, because they tend to have lower expenses and they're a little bit less complicated um, tax-wise. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and on today's episode, I am joined by Brian Martucci. Brian, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming back on the show, Brian. So for today's discussion, I wanted to go over some of the basics of bonds with you, how to invest in them and just some different bond investing strategies and maybe some products that are most suitable for millennials. Recently, we've had on some guests talking about bonds and suggesting they might be a good investment for millennials right now. But I also had some listeners message me saying they're not sure how to apply this as the bond universe is so large and investing in bonds is different than going out to your broker and investing in stocks. So I thought it'd be good to have you on and go over some of these bond basics. Definitely, yeah, sounds great. So I guess just to start off, I think it'd be helpful to talk about what are the benefits of investing in bonds to just help our listeners determine if adding some fixed income exposure to their portfolio makes sense, because it won't make sense for everyone, but I think this could help frame the conversation of who it might be good for. Yeah, that's that's a great question, a great way to start off. And yeah, bonds do make sense for a lot of millennial investors, a lot of younger investors. I think the biggest reason you'll hear people recommend that, that you invest in bonds is for um, diversification. They're sort of, you know, stocks and bonds aren't like opposite or, you know, it's not like a yin and yang situation, but they do ha- tend to have an inverse relationship historically, meaning in a good year for stocks, bonds won't do as well, but in a bad year for stocks, bonds tend to do better. This past year, the sort of post pandemic period has been a counter to that. Historically, it's been an aberration in that stocks and bonds have not done very well. But bonds have still performed better than stocks. It's been a really awful year for both. And actually, it's been a historically terrible year for bonds. So this is about the worst uh, bonds have ever done, which is kind of a good thing if, again, you're comparing to how the stock market has done, which is even worse. So going back to diversification, most younger investors, the recommendation is not that you are all in bonds or even a majority in bonds, depending on your risk tolerance. Maybe it's uh, 90% stocks, 10% bonds, or 80% stocks, 20% bonds. If you're a little bit more conservative, you can have higher allocation. Over time, as you get older, because bonds are, are generally less risky, the recommendation usually is to increase your bond holdings and decrease your stock holdings proportionally. But you know, we're talking as you get into your 50s and 60s. The benefits of bonds, there are several beyond the inverse relationship with stocks. One is capital preservation. So bonds, um, they're less risky than stocks overall. They're less volatile. And that means that they, you know, even bad years for bonds, the price swings tend to be less dynamic than with stocks, which is good if you're risk averse and you don't want to keep your money in cash, which is even less volatile and has less upside, but you still want to have the benefit of, you know, not owning stocks that are going to lose half their value over 18 months. Another thing, interest rates can be pretty attractive, you know, much better than even now than your money is going to do in the bank and um, generally higher than than stock dividends. Those interest payments are known as coupon payments, and they usually come semi-annually, so twice a year. And it's always predictable. It's fixed, usually fixed. Um, There are some exceptions that we'll probably talk about. Yeah, so that's really nice. It's predictable. And you can either reinvest those payments if you own a bond fund, or you can just, if you want income, you can just take those payments. And so that's another really helpful attribute. And yeah, and those are actually the two, the two big ones that for millennials tends to be cited. Yeah, I think that's really helpful the way you explain that, because when some of our guests come on and they recommend bonds or they say it's a good investment right now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for everyone because their strategy behind that might be shorter term or just might be more tactical. And so I kind of just wanted to go over the basics and go over some of the risks and benefits and then investors can figure out if it does make sense for them. 
And so I guess I do want to go over the risks of investing in bonds with you because it's different than equities. So can you talk about some of the main risks with bond investing? Sure. Yeah, there are several. The biggest one is, and it kind of gets at like a fundamental aspect of bonds, is that interest rates and prices tend to move. Bond prices tend to tend to have an inverse relationship. So when prevailing interest rate interest rates rise, bond prices tend to fall. That's why bonds have done so poorly this year because interest rates have gone up really fast. That essentially means that the value of the bonds that you hold is lower. So if you were to sell them, you know, just like if a stock declines in value and you sell it, you're gonna lose money. Same deal with bonds. And a lot of, not all, but a lot of the volatility in bond markets can be explained by interest rate movements or important benchmark rates are doing. The other risk, it's a little bit more theoretical or not theoretical, but less tangible is um, inflation risk. So, you know, bonds, um, right now we're in a high inflation environment. Inflation's at 40 years, year highs in the US and, and similarly in a lot of other parts of the world. And if bond rates don't rise to meet inflation, they actually, you know, since they're fixed, the real return is 4% annually, which is about where one year US treasuries are right now, but the inflation rate is eight or 9% where it is right now, your bond is actually losing four to 5% per year in real value. So it's better than putting your money in, you know, a savings account that only yields one or 2% interest, but you're not keeping pace. And right now in this current, most, most uh, bonds that we call investment grade, which we'll talk about later. They don't yield, you know, eight or nine percent. They're they're more in the mid single digits range. So, you know, in this kind of environment, you're losing value, and that's part of the reason why bonds haven't haven't done that well this year. There's also credit risk in the bond market. So every bond, when you you know, a bond is basically you're you're giving a company or a government agency or entity or government itself a loan. You know, just like any borrowing situation, the borrower has good or bad or in between credit and your likelihood of repayment of getting you know that bond repaid depends on the credit, the financial stability of that entity or that organization. So companies that aren't in a great financial position are more likely to default on their bonds, so not be able to repay them. Interest rates tend to be higher to account for that, but you're still dealing with a very real likelihood that, um, or a real possibility, I should say, that you're not going to get all the money back that you put in. With like governments, you know, the U.S. government, the credit risk is really just theoretical of the U.S. government and is quite low. So um, you, you can be very confident that you're going to get repaid on that bond and same for other, you know, developed economies like German bonds are famously, they famously have low interest rates because, you know, the German government is seen as very stable and um, Swiss bonds and so forth. But credit risk is still something to, to keep in mind if you're investing in bonds from, you know, emerging economies or from companies that aren't maybe in the best financial health. But there are a lot of bonds that they're thinly issued. There are only a few, you know, coupons or, or bonds that are circulating. And um, if no one wants to sell or no one wants to buy, there's really no no market for them. So if you want to get rid of a bond, um, it's not as simple as just like withdrawing money from it. You you might be stuck. Uh, so that's a, that's a big deal if you, and an important reason why you should look at bonds generally I should say re retail investors should look at bonds generally as more of a long-term investment. And uh, yeah, those are those are kind of the main the main drawbacks. All that said, bonds in general carry less risk than stocks. So as you mentioned, one of the biggest factors that influence bonds and one of the major risks is interest rate risk. So I want to dive into this one a bit deeper because this one is probably the most important to understand. So can you just walk us through how interest rates impact bond prices and yields? Sure. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, the relationship is basically inverse. When interest rates go up, bond prices tend to go down. but it's also true that shorter term bonds are are more sensitive to interest rate risk because they're just more there's less time that you have until they're repaid and the interest rate now has more effect on the interest or is more is going to be closer in all likelihood to the interest rate that you know exists when the bond is repaid uh, longer term bonds tend to be more 
influenced by inflation or like general kind of prognostications of rates. <laughs> you know, bond prices go down basically is, is how it works. So another piece that I kind of want to cover with you on this is having you talk about the difference between bonds with different maturities. So we know that the normal curve, the term structure of bonds is upward sloping. Can you just kind of walk us through why and kind of the risks behind investing in shorter term bonds versus longer term bonds? Sure. Yeah. If you plot the interest rate, like a smooth curve, um, you think of a graph with an X and Y axis and um, you're looking at uh, the yield as it relates to maturities, the yield is going to be lower in a normal environment. The yield is going to be lower uh, for shorter maturities, like, you know, six months, one year, two years than it is for longer maturities, like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And that's because there's more inherent risk in holding bonds for longer periods of time because we, you know, the future gets harder to predict. The farther you go out, more risk of periods of higher inflation that will um, affect the bond's returns. There are other, there are other risks that can arise, um, you know, when you're starting to look beyond one year or two years, it just gets a lot. It just gets a lot less certain. And um, now the the yield curve currently is actually isn't behaving as normal for some weird reason. So the yield curve is flat to inverted, depending depending on when you look at it, and that can be um, a sign of shorter term economic problems or expectations that they're going to be economic problems in, in the future. We've heard a lot of talk about, uh, or in the near future, we've heard a lot of talk about recession um, coming you know, next year. And the yield curve is telling us that we should take those concerns seriously. I mean, we can talk more about that if you'd like. Yeah, it is interesting because I saw this morning that the 10-year yield has now hit its highest level since the global financial crisis, and the two-year uh -huh. yield is also at its highest level since 2007. So it's just interesting. The bond prices in the bond market, it just has lots of information about other markets and markets' expectations. And so I think that's a really interesting thing about looking at bonds. It just like, that information in the prices. I don't, I don't know how much stock you want to, you'd want to put in this, but sort of a, a lot of, if you ask a lot of people, they'll say that the bond market is sort of the smartest money around. So like what the bond market does should be taken really seriously, uh, more so than what you know individual stocks are doing or even the broader stock market. When the yield curve inverts or when yields, one, one specific, when we're talking about yield curve inversions, we look at pairs of, of bonds often. So one common pair that, that people look at for clues about what's happening in the economy is the 10-year um, the and the two-year U.S. Treasuries. You know, as we talked about, the two year in a normal environment should have a lower yield than the 10 year because the 10 year is a much longer maturity. But recently and currently, the two year yields higher than the, the 10 year, although the 10 year is really spiking as well. So every month that people look at and that's a more, you know, that curve should basically never be inverted. So when it is, it's usually a sign. It's almost always a sign of a recession historically. And then there are other ones that they're kind of more esoteric ones like Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, uh, said that he prefers looking at the relationship between the three month and derivative of the expectations for the three months, 18 months from now, which is kind of confusing, but that's a more like, you know, that's kind of like high finance, like you're, you're just looking at like synthetic products that most people don't most retail investors don't deal with, but they still tell us important things about where the economy could be going. So when the yield curve is inverted, can you talk about what's going on to create that? Is it a scenario where there's more demand for those long-term treasuries and so more investors are buying them and bidding down so the price is going up and then the yields are going down compared to the two-year? Yeah, that's that's a good way to describe it. It's relative. So the demand for both might be lower than in different periods. But yeah, the relative demand for the longer term security is the longer term bond is is higher. And so they're bidding the price down relative to the, the shorter term, which, um, you know, people don't don't want to own as much because of the uncertainty. 
And then I guess the next thing I want to talk with you about is the two broad different types of bonds we can invest in. So starting on the highest level, government versus corporate bonds. Can you talk a bit about those and maybe the key differences investors should know about? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So government bonds, um, we've, we've been talking about U.S. Treasuries a lot and sovereign governments all issue bonds or, or generally. I, I don't know for sure that every country in the world issues bonds, but I would assume that they do. Um, there are really you know common bonds like U.S. Treasuries, German bonds, um, Swiss bonds and, you know, the, the U.K., Bonds have been in the the news a lot because of the political instability over there. Those are called gilts. So yeah, national governments they're always issuing bonds to fund their their activities. Uh, there are also municipal bonds, at least in the U.S., where more local units of government are issuing them. So cities can we can talk more about. And then yeah, on the the corporate bond side, a lot of companies that need to raise capital, you know, a common way for companies to raise money is to go public, but companies that are already public and don't want to issue more shares, they often issue corporate bonds that, you know, have the debt financing. It's just, you know, it's borrowing and um, that can help fund their activities. And every bond, you know, government or corporate has a credit rating. Um, that depends on the financial strength of of the issuer, but especially on the corporate bond side, there is a lot of difference between you know a blue chip company that's issuing that's issuing a corporate bond that's very likely to be repaid, and maybe a more of a, a high flying company that could you know come back down to earth, or um, just companies that aren't as mature in their markets. Those are a lot riskier to invest in. So then for investors, maybe thinking about wanting to add some bonds to their portfolio, either corporate or government bonds, it's a bit different than buying stocks. Can you talk about how investors can buy bonds? Yeah, it depends on what bond you're buying. A lot of professional, or I shouldn't say a lot of, but the brokerages that cater to more professional or experienced investors, like um, interactive brokers, for example, right through the brokerage, um, either on the secondary market and sometimes as um, initial issues. So that's helpful. If you want to hold a bond directly, you can buy treasuries or corporate bonds or municipal bonds. You can also buy bonds directly from um, the U.S. government or U.S. Treasury bonds, at least. Um, the website Treasury Direct is the place to, to do that. They don't have every type of bond that they issue but you can buy longer term bonds there. I think 20 and 30 year bonds, also I bonds, which are inflation protected bonds. A lot of people, practically speaking, don't buy bonds directly. They invest in bond funds, which are more liquid. They're appropriate for your average millennial retail investor um, because they tend to have lower expenses and they're a little bit less complicated um, tax wise. And you're not investing in specific bonds when you're buying an ETF, but you're investing in a diversified basket of bonds that fit your short-term government, uh, U.S. government bonds. And so I guess just on the ETFs, so that's kind of a good way to get a diversified basket of bonds, like you mentioned. But I'm wondering if you have any tips of what millennials should look for when comparing different bond ETFs. Is there's like stocks, there's a lot of different ETFs out there. So what should they be looking for oh, when yeah. comparing these? Yeah, um, kind of just like stock ETFs, you you definitely want to pay attention to the expense ratio. So the fee that the ETF takes to to manage itself, those can vary a lot based on how the ETF is managed. So passive ETFs are managed with a really light touch. They tend to have super low expense ratios, like below 0.1 percent. So you're paying very very little to, and that's annualized. So you're paying very very little to to keep that bond in your portfolio uh, or bond ETFs. You know they might perform a little bit better um, because they're being actively managed and the the managers are looking for for opportunities. But that expense ratio can really eat into your returns, especially when we're talking about bonds where the volatility is lower. So the the gap between the kind of worst case scenario and the best case scenario for your returns is is a lot smaller than it is for a stock ETF. So that's that's an important one. Um, and you want to look also at the type of bonds that, that are being held in the ETF. So if you want to invest in municipal bonds, you want to buy a municipal bond ETF. Um, if you want to invest in U.S. 
government bonds, you buy a, a treasury ETF, but you also want to look at the risk of the underlying investment. So municipal bonds, even though they're government bonds, can be a lot riskier than U.S. government bonds because not every city or state or county is you know, financially in a strong position. They can't just print money for themselves. Same deal with like emerging market bond funds. Those tend to have higher yields, which which make them more attractive. But that's partly because, you know, sovereign governments can run into serious lower profile examples of countries that run into serious financial trouble that their bondholders often, you know, end up taking, they might get some of their investment back, but um, they're not going to be made whole necessarily. And that's, that's a significant risk. So it's important to for you to just kind of think about the worst case scenario and, and invest accordingly. And I guess the other thing I kind of want to point out about bond ETFs versus investing in just a corporation or government bond is the par value. So for ETFs, it's just all based on market price. You don't get that par value, but if you're investing in an individual bond, then even if it goes, the price goes down as interest rates go up, if you hold it to maturity, you'll still get your money back, but that's not the case with ETFs. But I'm just wondering if I guess ETFs are more sensitive to price swings or not in the interest rates or how you think about that. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you offhand, like, you know, specific ETFs, how they compare to the underlying bonds in terms of their sensitivity to price changes. But generally speaking, I mean, you make a really good point that if you have a long time horizon, and so you can afford to hold a five-year bond or a 10-year bond to maturity, that is always preferable to investing in an ETF and hoping that you're going to have an equivalent value at the end of that time frame. Because ETFs, they own the underlying bonds that they're invested in, but they don't have maturities. They just keep going because they're always buying and selling bonds with new maturities. So you can invest in an ETF, a short-term U.S. government bond ETF that holds you know, bonds with maturities no longer than five years for 15 years or 20 years or 30 years, if you want, it's just going to keep rolling over into new bonds. And it's going to have a new, those bonds are going to have new coupon rates based on what the bond market has done in the meantime. So holding, holding individual bonds is preferable for get all of your investment back. But the flip side to that is that holding bonds directly can be cumbersome, you know, because you have to buy them individually. That's sometimes easier said than done, depending on the bond. And a lot of bonds have the coupon, the smallest unit of the bond is often fairly high in dollar terms, like a thousand dollars maybe, or even more. And, or there's a minimum investment that you have to make. So from a practical perspective, if you don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to invest, it's more within reach to invest in a, a bond ETF that you just have very small slices of those coupons, but you're still getting that exposure. So they're kind of pros and cons. So I also want to talk to you about iSavings bonds because you mentioned those before and with rising inflation, investors are looking for products to kind of help them hedge against this inflation. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about this product and how that kind of compares to the ones we've already talked about. The iSavings bonds are kind of an interesting case. They're not really like other bonds or not like too many other bonds, at least. Um, they are for... U.S. persons, uh, you know, people who live in the U.S., I believe you need a social security number to buy iSavings bonds. And their like key differentiator is that they are inflation protected. So their coupon rate, their interest rate changes every six months in part on what the inflate, the actual inflation rate is doing the consumer price index in the United States. So they're inherently protected against the inflation risk that we talked about. And it doesn't mean they're always a great investment relative to stocks, but if you hold an I bond, at least in theory, your investment won't lose value. You'll, it'll always keep up with inflation. Whereas if you hold just you know a, a not inflation protected um, U.S. Treasury bond and inflation goes up, you know your interest rate won't follow, so you will be um, you'll be losing money. So um, yeah, so as as far as uh, I bonds go, they're a great investment for kind of longer term savings if you're looking to not just have your money in a bank account. That said, there are some important restrictions that 
make them less, you know, less ideal. They're not the perfect investment. So one important restriction is that you can only buy $10,000 worth of I bonds a year per person. It's per social security number. So if, even if you file taxes jointly with, with your spouse, you can both buy $10,000 worth of bonds. That limit you know, will be a big deal for some people who are maybe higher earners and more conservative um, in terms of how they invest. Probably, you know, a lot of people won't be able to hit it and that's that's fine. There is some talk in Congress of increasing the um, investment limit per year to like $30,000, I think, uh, which would be great, you know, for, for people who can afford, you know, who can meet, meet that. The other issue restriction is that you can't cash out of an I-bond right away. Um, and again, these are long-term investments, so you you, you wouldn't want to, but you you literally can't sell in the first year. And so you have to hold it for 12 months. And then between the one year mark and the five year mark, there's a penalty if you cash out. Um, so it's equivalent to three months of interest, which the longer it goes on, the less of a big deal that is, but it's still something to keep in mind. Then after five years, you can cash out with no penalty and your bond, if you do nothing, will mature in 30 years. So pretty long time horizon. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good investment if you are concerned about inflation and you're watching, you know, the money you have in your savings account kind of dwindle away. I-bonds are good. So I am wondering, since it has that added protection of inflation, is it kind of offset then by a lower yield compared to other government or corporate bonds? It Well, yeah, like the yield has two parts to it. There's kind of like a base, a base yield, which does change based on the bond market, but isn't like directly in tied, to, tied to inflation. And then there's the inflation part, which at least in theory, it gets it back up to the inflation rate. It resets every six months. So inflation can vary within that time. It's not going to be a perfect match, but generally in periods of high inflation, your your I bonds will, will keep up. The rates reset for all bonds. So like if you buy an I bond, let's say I buy an I bond, uh, I bond this month, the rates are going to reset in uh, in November. So so coming up, and that's going to affect the rate on my bond, not just on bonds that are bought in November. And then that'll keep. Now the I bond rate is nine point six three percent, I believe. Um, that'll change next month. It'll probably it'll be similar, I would think. Uh, might go down slightly. And then over time, though, as hopefully inflation kind of cools off, the rate on the I bonds that I bought this month will decline quite a bit. So, um, you know, back in the like early 2010s when inflation was basically nothing, I bonds were not seen as a good investment because they, you know, you might as well have your money in a savings account. It was it was going to be about the same return. They have you know performed much better in recent years, but it's still something to keep in mind that it's not always going to be that sky high interest rate that you're getting right now. And it's at least in theory, you're not really going to gain anything in real terms. You're just going to keep pace with, with inflation. So historic, like over longer periods of time, you're still probably better off investing in the stock market. Although it kind of depends what your longer term expectations of inflation are. Yeah. And I think that's a good point to point out. It's that the stock market has outperformed bonds over the long term, but it kind of depends when you need that money. Yeah. If you need that money for a large investment, maybe in the near term, next few years, then you might be more focused on just keeping your capital preservation and making sure that you're yeah. not getting eroded by inflation versus trying to accumulate as much wealth and really on that growth aspect. So it just depends on your current investment strategy and needs. And I also want to talk to you about, I guess, on the iSavings bonds, um, are there any tax benefits that investors should know about? Yeah, there are tax benefits. So you do have to pay federal income tax on your uh, I-bond interest. But if your state has a state income to income tax, you don't have to pay local income tax either. Um, so it's an even better deal for people who live in higher tax areas than folks who live in, in states without income taxes. There are advantages. It's not quite a tax benefit, but you can use the interest for education expenses as well. Um, so they're kind of like a backdoor college savings fund in that way. Um, that's not like a, I wouldn't say that's a, a reason to go out and buy I bonds. The, um, the state and local tax benefits are probably probably a bigger, a bigger deal for most people. 
And then how can investors get exposure to these? Where can they buy them? So the uh, the best place and actually maybe the only place to buy them, is, at least now, is um, the Treasury Direct website. Um, so I believe it's treasurydirect.gov. The website's kind of wonky. People make fun of it, but it works. And um, you can you know, create an account. Um, I did it earlier this year. It took probably less than an hour. I don't remember exactly. It was it was pretty painless, sort of like opening a bank account. You just buy the bonds directly there. They're, they're new issues. There's uh, no secondary market for uh, I bonds, at least that I'm that I'm aware of. If you want to cash out, you just you know, you basically sell it, sell it back to the, the government through Treasury Direct. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. I I'm trying to f- like figure out a reason if if you have extra cash why you wouldn't want to buy I bonds. Um, but I really <laughs> I really can't. It's a good supplement to your savings. However much you want to buy, I think you can buy in hundred dollar increments. Not positive about that, but uh, yeah, they're pretty accessible and and uh, pretty good deal all around. And then the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, because I know you have an article written on this, is exchange traded notes. Yeah. And I guess how those are different from bond ETFs. Right. Yeah. That's that's a good question. Um, exchange traded notes aren't aren't as common as bond ETFs, and the biggest difference is that they don't own the underlying bond. So, like when you when you buy a bond ETF, you're indirectly buying the bonds themselves because the the ETF's manager or issuer owns them. An ETN, uh, exchange traded note, is I couldn't explain how how this is done, but you might have a, an exchange traded note that holds short term U.S. government bonds, but they don't actually hold those bonds. They just kind of mimic the price of what an ETF that holds those bonds would do. That matters because there is tracking risk involved, which means that if the ETN isn't actively managed, it could, over time, the price could diverge from the underlying basket of securities, whereas the ETF is more likely to mirror the the price. Um, it's it's still not perfect for an ETF, but it's there's less tracking risk, less tracking risk in that way. And uh, exchange traded notes also have more li- liquidity risk because they tend to be traded more thinly than bond ETFs. So you can really get into a situation where you just can't find a buyer at the price you want to, the price you want to sell for, or vice versa. That can affect your returns uh, quite a bit. The under is also important because um, should the issuer go belly up, you have less recourse. From a practical perspective, you, you're probably not going to get all your money back if a bond ETF goes belly up, but um, you still have more protection. And just generally, if you hold hold bonds directly, than you do from with a, an instrument that doesn't really hold any assets directly, if that makes sense. Definitely. It's, it's more like investing in, in a stock where it can go to zero and you know, that's it, you, you're out of luck. For sure. And then I guess the last investment product I wanna talk to you about is preferred shares because we're looking for investments that do well in high inflation and rising interest rate environments right now. And preferred shares are interesting because they fall into the category of performing well during rising interest rate environments, especially the ones that are rate reset preferred shares. So I was wondering if you can just talk a bit about what preferred shares are, and then maybe we could go over some examples of some. Sure. Yeah. Um, so preferred shares, they're a type of stock. They're, they're sort of like a hybrid between stocks and bonds, but they're they're treated more like stocks. The I guess the best way to think about them is there are stocks that you know trade on an exchange um, or over the counter, but they they trade on the secondary market. They have uh, they pay dividends that are generally higher than the corporation's common stock dividends. So just making this up, but if you had a company that paid a 3% dividend on their common stock, the preferred stock dividend might be 6%. And unlike bonds, they don't have maturity dates. They just trade, they trade indefinitely, kind of like bond ETFs. There is liquidity risk with preferred shares that uh, often isn't, does, isn't present with common stock. The number of shares tends to be a lot greater. So the market's much more liquid. The pricing is much more efficient. Preferred shares, oftentimes, you know, some companies, their preferred shares don't trade every day. So that can be, you know, again, it's better to look at it as a longer term investment. And there's still a potential for price risk there. The one benefit 
that's often cited of preferred shares is you're ahead of in the queue, you're ahead of common stockholders if the company goes bankrupt. Generally, preferred shareholders, they don't get much, if any, of their money back, but you're still there's still a little bit more of a likelihood that you're going to get repaid something. Um, bondholders are much more likely to get repaid, though, so that's definitely not you know a reason to uh, invest in preferred shares over over common shares. And yeah, uh, preferred share prices also have more correlation with the underlying fundamentals of the company, whereas bonds bond price, even for corporate bonds, they tend to be more sensitive to interest rate risk and more like economic factors. Um, So if you're kind of looking to mirror the performance of the company, that can be helpful. Yeah. Thanks for explaining all of that. I really like preferred shares. I've been adding it's ZPR to my portfolio. That's for my Canadian listeners. It holds preferred shares of energy stocks and some Canadian banks. And it's just kind of like what you mentioned. You have preference for dividend payment if anything were to happen. And so it gives you exposure to these companies kind of in a different way. And so another thing that I like about it is that with the rate reset preferred shares, they're reset as interest rates are rising. So you should get a higher yield as interest rates rise. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a hedge against rising interest rates, which is nice in this environment. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if if you can find rate reset preferred shares that meet your investment goals, I would definitely say, yeah, because you know, inflation will come and go, but it's nice to have that downside protection when you know when we're in a hot inflation environment like we are right now. Yeah, but then the other thing to remember is the coin will flip. So it's when the Fed pivots and they start going down, then in the next few years, the preferred shares won't perform as well. But it's just the point of, I guess, diversifying your portfolio to meet your investment needs and your objectives. So if you need some more diversification, then not everything in your portfolio will be going up at the same time. Yeah, totally agree. It's a great point. And then I'm just wondering, do you have any funds that you would like to share with our listeners on bonds that maybe you've done some research on? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I would always encourage everyone to, to do their own research, not really recommending these per se, um, you know, so definitely make sure that you do your own due diligence, but um, some pretty popular and straightforward bond funds that I think a lot would be suitable for a lot of millennials is one is uh, the ticker is VTEB. It's the Vanguard uh, tax exempt bond ETF. It has a super low expense ratio, I think 0.06%, give or take. And it holds mostly municipal bonds and some bonds issued by states in the United States. And the tax benefits are a little less clear cut than they would be if you were buying municipal bonds directly, but there may still be some some tax benefits to to holding tax exempt bonds in, in general. And again, that's not necessarily a reason to invest in this particular fund, but it's something to keep in mind because it can, um, you know, your returns can be a little bit higher than they would be otherwise. Another one along those lines is PZA is the ticker. It's uh, the Invesco municipal bond ETF. Same kind of deal. You're investing in mostly local governments, their bond issues. Um, We were talking about short term U.S. Treasury bonds. And um, a good one for that is the iShares core uh, one to five year U.S. bond ETF. ISTB is the ticker. That also has a really low expense ratio. It's just kind of a way to to get exposure to shorter term U.S. Treasury bonds. Um, and right now, those are because of the yield curve inversion that we were talking about. Those are performing in terms of their yield, performing really well by historical standards. So, if you're looking for income um, in the short term, that could be a good uh, a good bond ETF to buy into. Thank you for sharing those, Brian. I think that is all I had for today. Before we close out the episode, can you remind our listeners where they can go to read all your articles and connect with you? Sure. Yeah, I uh, am at moneycrashers.com. I'm the finance editor there. Um, We have tons of articles about um, a lot of what we talked about. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This This has been great. Thank you so much.
if you're still hoping for the turnaround in Zoom, the Facebook, Tesla, that ship has sailed. That was the previous bull market. The current bear market has marked the end of that bull market. Think about what the next bull market is going to be. It's not going to be in the same place. Lightning never strikes twice in the same area.